Good morning. It's Aya Wimala, and I think I told you yesterday that today, Friday, April the 2nd, that I would uh, be done reading from Usayado, Sayado Utejaniya's book, Collecting Gold Dust, but I can't resist because there's a beautiful section I'd like to, uh, yesterday the uh, section on right speech I thought was really appropriate. And so this one is on uh, thinking. And I thought that, and I thought, yeah, I thought about that. <laughs> and, and felt like it was a really important one as well. Because, you know, the Buddha always encouraged us to increase skillful, wholesome thoughts and keep the ones that are unskillful and unwholesome at bay and uh, then replace the unwholesome ones with the wholesome. So we need to know a lot about our thinking <clears throat> and how to work with that because we probably all are wanting to have kind of a step-by-step -step way to change any kind of the thinking that bothers us and troubles us and those habits that we can get into. And so I think the more we can I feel that the more we can uh, work with, with our, our thinking, everything else kind of flows from that very often. So let's, I'd like to start, I love Pema Chodron's From Welcoming the Unwelcome. This is what she says at the beginning of her talk, she told us. May bodhicitta, precious and sublime, arise where it has not yet come to be, and where it has arisen, may it never fail, but grow and flourish ever more and more. And bodhicitta is that awakened heart, heart-mind. So, one more dive into this little jewel and Then, we, then we'll move on. So this is called Thinking Processes. <clears throat> and it comes later in the book under the day by day. And yesterday I was reading from the speech, which is, was just a little bit before this. Thinking Processes. We need insight into the nature of the thinking mind because much of our suffering comes from thoughts. Have you ever thought, what if this car gets into an accident? How did that feel? There is fear when I is involved, but the mind is free when it knows a thought as just a thought. <laughs> Thinking in the right way is part of the practice. Meditators are often afraid of thinking about meditation, but in fact, to do any kind of work, we need to consider the situation, reflect, and think. We use wisdom to make fewer mistakes and we actively reflect on meditation work that's productive and useful. This helps us recognize what's helpful in our practice and strengthen that when we are observing, experience, and experiencing, and thinking about how to practice. It all comes together. The thinking mind in itself is neither wholesome nor unwholesome. It is the motivation of defilements or wisdom behind the thinking mind that determines the quality of the thought. We are concerned with this quality of mind. Naturally arising thoughts are not a problem because they are, not, they are just objects to be known. Of course, if there is a defilement, we ought to deal with it and not let it carry on unchecked. If, on the other hand, it is wholesome, we can encourage it. It is best not to observe the thinking mind alone. 
Also watch the feelings that accompany this thinking so that you can know when it is becoming too much. You can also gently allow the overthinking to continue and learn from it. You will experience when it has become too much and having this experience will allow you to learn from overthinking. When there are strong, wholesome qualities in the mind, it is difficult for the mind to suddenly change and become unwholesome. When there is a strong, unwholesome train of thought going on, it's difficult, it's difficult for it to suddenly switch and become wholesome. I experimented for myself when my mind was wholesome. I tried to intentionally think negative thoughts and realize that I could not. Know that not all dhammas related, wait a minute, know that not all dhamma related thinking will necessarily be wholesome. Sometimes a self-righteousness or attachment will be fueling it. When dhamma-related thinking has to do with your actual practice, it's probably helpful. It's helpful to think about the dhamma, and it's okay if you don't understand things straight away. The Buddha recommended this kind of consideration because you never know when the mind might be in the right state and suddenly understand. Take in enough information to help you understand whether this information is beneficial, suitable, too much, too little, or balanced. If you can see the wanting to think, know that. Observe the intensity of the wanting. When, through skillful observation, the wanting diminishes, the thoughts will also diminish. If you can't see the intentions to think, just switch back and forth between thoughts and body as objects. Lost in thought. Do you know that you are walking when you are walking around in daily life? You will often be lost in thought. If you realize that this is happening, just know the mind is thinking. What is important is is what is happening in this moment. You can do what you need to do when you arrive at your destination. There's no need to think about it now. This way the mind will also think less about the future. You can expend a lot of mental energy speculating about the future without actually knowing what is going to happen. If you discover a very different outcome than what you had expected, you have spent a lot of energy on imagination. There was a businessman who went to the market to buy goods wholesale to resell, to resell later. His journey to the market was filled with thoughts of various prices, how he would try to get there before everybody to get the first pick of goods. When he arrived, he found there was nothing there for him. This businessman was a meditator and so he was aware of what his mind was doing this whole time. He realized how much time he had wasted speculating and determined that on future market trips, he would relax and make decisions when he arrived. <laughs> it's a good story to remember. Memories and planning. The concept or story is about the past or future but the knowing of that is in the present moment. You need to consider how you might respond to a certain situation so that you arrive prepared, but this is not the same as worrying about a situation. If you are planning and knowing with wisdom that this is happening, that's the present moment. Planning is necessary, but could be done with either defilements or wisdom. Do you worry when you're planning? Some people plan with greed and others with anxiety, but there is a way to plan and think in a relaxed way. Thinking about past events will also happen naturally from time to time, and there's nothing you can do about it. You can't go back and change the situation. You can only revisit the past in thought. However, 
You can learn a lesson and not repeat the same mistakes. One yogi dropped. One yogi realized that the idea of one second of time was a concept, and the past dropped away for him with just this understanding. Awareness at work. Meditating at work is a skill, and by skill I mean lots of practice initially. Of course, when you pay attention to outside phenomena, you can't concentrate on phenomena inside. When you put your mind inside, when you put your mind inside, you can't really be aware of what is happening outside. Initially, you might not be able to be aware of inside and outside when you are working, but try to practice whenever you can to allow momentum to build. At some point, awareness will kick in naturally while you're doing something you're really absorbed in. Getting to this level of awareness requires consistent practice. When you need to be working, just do it fully. Sometimes you will have more time to devote to your practice and do it freely, and you will know something like, oh, the mind is thinking about this, so it can do that. When you build the habit of noticing the mind at work, then you will notice that awareness just starts popping up because it becomes a habit for the mind to recognize itself doing work. This will just come in naturally. Allow this to happen. A yogi once asked a question about building up continuous practice. How much should we do? I said, do it 50-50. The yogi was a psychiatrist, so he thought a minute about my suggestion and asked, how do you measure? <laughs> I considered it and realized that it wasn't as much about a division of 50-50 as much as allowing the mind to do its work naturally. If it, is a very pra if it is very practiced, then the knowing happens naturally. When you have a continuous practice that reminds and remembers and knows the mind at work, <clears throat> then it gets to the point where it becomes effortless because the mind becomes so familiar and so intimate with itself. It is always with itself and it likes being with itself. That's when it allows the mind to do anything because it doesn't mind. It's, it's always with itself. The operative word is continuously. Although it is difficult in the beginning, any amount of effort you put in brings momentum, and that in turn makes it more effortless and continuous in the future. That's why the Buddha said to practice continually and continuously. When the mind says it's not fair, when something happens, the mind starts making judgments, sets up perimeters, and develops ideas of what's appropriate and boundaries of you and me. Once hooked on these ideas, the mind won't like it when one of these ideas is violated. We encounter this all the time in Western society. People wait in a line because there is a belief that people should wait their turn for something. There is a dissonance when someone cuts that line and thoughts that they should be in line start coming up. Or different thoughts of fairness might come up. There could be another kind of belief. I wanted to get my food and she has slowed that down by jumping the queue. The mind has convinced itself of all these strands of thoughts. At times like these, we should ask ourselves, what internal belief is being thwarted here? Right now, someone's actions are frustrating these beliefs, and the mind justifies this anger against the other person. That uh, this isn't fair or that isn't fair is a big one. And he has a simple solution. Stringing each other along. In daily life, we give each other compliments and thank each other for their 
compliments. We string each other along by reinforcing the need to look good and feel good. If instead we had said, you look really terrible, the listener might get irritated because people want to feel good. We are often at the mercy of other people's words, compliments, or insults, and are generally automatically affected. When there is an understanding of how these thoughts work in the background, the wanting will disappear. And that's a big one, too, in our society, right? Feeling like being taken advantage of. It is very important that there is a right attitude when we are working in the world. Sometimes we may feel like we are being taken advantage of or being, take, or being taken for granted. How different would it be if we thought these people were acting in a certain way because they didn't know any better. If someone were bullying you, it would be really tough to handle. You may get tense, agitated, or angry with the bully. What if you thought that this person was only inadvertently doing these things because she didn't know better? How would you feel then? You can better understand and forgive. Self-judgment. Bad is just a label. Don't label yourself that. When the mind is wholesome, the person is good. And when the mind is unwholesome, the person is bad. It's only for that moment, and that's always changing. This is really, that's a really important sentence. It's only for that moment, and that's always changing. Continue to practice and take your time. The fact that you are practicing shows that your mind wants to become better, and that means that the mind will become better. When doubt is strong in the mind, do not pay attention to these thoughts. Once we give attention to these kinds of thoughts, they suck us in and grow. We can anchor ourselves to feelings instead and not give any power to the conceptual thinking. Follow the same principle for other strong, unwholesome states. When we look at the feeling and discontinue looking at the thoughts, it will help the mind calm down. Then we can look at these thoughts and feelings together when we feel we're ready. Everyone has his or her own path, and there's a natural course that needs to unfold for each person. You can watch what's happening in the mind and understand it, but you can't force it. You may learn a technique at a retreat, but it is when you go home that you can apply that technique all the time. That's when your life changes. Okay, and there's one more section. It's about silence, so this is, it's very short, just a few paragraphs. Preconceptions. How do you experience silence? How do you experience the stillness of a garden or the woods? I've asked different people this question. Fear comes up for some people. Youngsters tell me that they get bored when there's nothing to occupy them. As you can see, good or bad depends on the person experiencing it, depending on their preconceived feelings of it. There are tons of these accumulations that you have from childhood, and you really want to see these ideas that have built up over the years. If these little preconceptions are seen properly, then the mind will no longer be disturbed by what is happening. If you continue to meditate regularly, there ought to be fewer and fewer attachments. And those are those those attachments to all of all of uh, our experiences from our childhood up. Giving comes in different ways. The market where I had my shop was a very busy place. Lots of shops were lined up side by side with narrow alleys between them. Shopkeepers sent goods in and out with carriers who ran back and forth for the shopkeepers. People would run quite blindly, not caring who was in the way. I would get irritated whenever I had to get out of the way, which was quite often. 
I knew that people would run into me if I didn't move aside, but also became annoyed that I was the one who always had to be careful. This was a daily occurrence. When I began to practice continuously, I became mindful of my irritation with this market situation. After being mindful of it regularly for a long time, I actually began to see it as a good practice to give space to these people to prevent accidents. And I saw moving aside as a practice of generosity. As I practiced day after day and mindfulness arose, good actions also followed. The aversion that accompanied the critical mind decreased. With aversion gone, I began to feel metta for these people. Well, I could keep reading, <laughs> but I think his, th these words are so wise. So I will stop at this point. Uh, I'm always inspired when I read his writing. It just, it seems like everything he says is, is just beautiful. Um, so I'll put, put him aside. And let's see if I've read our, read our time away. I think I have. So uh, you can sit now. I hope you have time to because I've used our time. Let me send some uh, merit with this very simple, very uh, beautiful way to do it. May the actions that we take towards the good, toward understanding ourselves, toward being more peaceful, be of benefit to all beings everywhere. So it's a beautiful sunny day. Have a beautiful day. Oh, I'm glad. <clears throat> Thank you, Jamie. She said she enjoys hearing the book excerpts. <laughs> I get carried away with them. Um, Thank you. Have a beautiful day and be sure to try and practice continuously. And that's being mindful continuously. Uh, and I love the last statement that he said when he was working in a busy market. He eventually realized that his being the one to move and step aside and let the people dashing back and forth uh, go so there wouldn't be a, a conflict or a, a someone knocking someone else down. He realized he could see it as a sign of generosity and view it that way, and then he could give it as his gift. And uh, then, he, then he was able to see it as an opportunity to practice metta. So um, I think that's, that's what we need to do in our everyday lives, is just think of it. This is just the continuation of our practice. When we're sitting at home, we're, we're learning to understand our mind more clearly and to more deeply, which then gives us the knowledge we need to begin practicing continuously, whether we're alone or not, whether we're at work or not, uh, in all situations. That's our goal. So um, I hope we all have good opportunities to practice that this weekend. And uh, it's wonderful to have you here sharing my practice. So I'll see you Sunday morning. Thank you so much.